everybody. Thank you so much for joining uh, for round two of Instruments of Change. Um, for those of you who could not be here or logged on late on Tuesday, do not fret those videos uh, along with today's and tomorrow's will be uploaded onto the MLAB website. And so I will not repeat uh, the introduction I did that day, um, but really want to thank all of our speakers today and all of the audience for logging on. Um, I'm going to hand this over to our chair, Richard Weller, um, who's chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Thanks, Karen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, so this is the second day of the symposium, and um, in, it's, it's really a historical event in the sense that this represents the launch of the MLAB here at Penn, which is a key part of the McCarg Centre, the department's research centre. And the launch of the MLAB continues a tradition of engaging with dig digital technology here at Penn um, and should, I think, take it all to a whole new level. Um, and it allows us to focus in on certain research directions and questions, the broadest of which I suppose would be how designers might contribute to emergent philosophies and ethics of technology. Um, but more specifically within that, the question is how landscape architects, I think, can develop more critical and more creative and perhaps even more practical applications of technology. So, you know, with um, Karen and Keith and now Bobby and, and Sean, now leading this new laboratory, I think we can look forward to a new period of experimentation at Penn, which is really exciting. And I do think the key to this is in the expression laboratory. Obviously, environment and modelling are two important words, but the laboratory is by definition a place of experimentation. And so I think we can all look forward to seeing what those experiments are as the MLAB starts to develop its momentum. Um, I'm going to hand over now to the MC for the day, someone that is no stranger to either technology or experimentation, Mr. Brad Cantrell, the Chair of Landscape Architecture at Virginia. So thanks, Brad, over to you. Thank you, Richard. Let me share my screen here really quick. All right, it's working for everybody? Not yet, not yet. Uh, is anyone else seeing it? I'm not seeing it. No, I ju it just says Bradley is sharing his screen, but we don't see anything. All right, just a sec. Again here. How's that? There we go. We can now see the slide. Great. Um, Zoom seemed to crash right whenever I, I did that. Um, thank you, Richard, and welcome everyone. As I'm currently residing in Central Virginia, I would like to uh, like to begin with the recognition that I'm located on the land of the Monacan people. We give our honor and respect. We also acknowledge the enslaved laborers that built the grounds and architecture of the University of Virginia and have contributed to the spaces we occupy here today. Thank you for joining us today for Simulated Landscapes, Modeling Change, the second panel at the Instruments of Change Symposium. Um, as mentioned, I'm Bradley Cantrell, Professor and Chair of Landscape Architecture at the University of Virginia. I'll be co-moderating this panel with Karen McCloskey, co-director of the Environmental Modeling Lab and Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. This session explores different types of models that are deployed across a range of disciplines to simulate material behavior for forecasting change and for feedback to test scenarios. Both numerical and physical models are developed to simulate and visualize the dynamics of environmental processes, as well as the effects that these processes have on other materials. Such process-based models expand our ability to both experiment with and forecast potential change by incorporating varied conditions and parameters. 
Modeling has taken on an increasingly important role given the scale and complexity of weather-related events due to a rapidly warming planet, along with growing uncertainty regarding the future of our lived condition. Importantly, these models represent a new reality of the world we live in, a surrogate for human senses and a mechanism for the development of design intuitions. Today, we hear from four panelists across a range of disciplines that are examining the efficacy of models to test performance, envision material assemblies, optimize human settlement, and for their potential to spawn the imaginary. So I'll introduce our panelists uh, in reverse, I believe reverse order, starting with um, Robert Pietrusco, who's an associate professor of landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. His research and practice focus on the history and speculative design potential of environmental media and modeling. His design work is part of the permanent collection of the Cartier Foundation of Contemporary Art in Paris and has been exhibited in more than 15 countries at venues such as MoMA, Palais de Tokyo, ZKM Center for Art and Media, and the Venice Architecture Biennale. For the last three years, Pietrusco has been a, fac a visiting faculty member at the Strelka Institute for Media, Architecture, and Design in Moscow and has recently awarded the American Academy Rome Prize for Landscape Architecture. Next, Ilmar Herskins is an architect and researcher invest, interested in digital terrain modeling technologies and the development of new design and construction processes with natural granular material. He is a postdoctoral researcher at Gramazio Kohler Research and lecturer at the Master of Science in Landscape Architecture at ETH Zurich. Previously, Erkins worked at the Chair of Landscape Architecture, Professor Giraud, where he directed design research studios and developed digital tools for large-scale landscape design. He is co-founder of Landscape, a laboratory for landscape transformation, and he practices landscape architecture with projects in Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Greece. In, in 2020, Herzkins was nominated for the ETH Medal of Outstanding Doctoral Research for his dissertation, Robotic Landscapes, Topological Approaches to Terrain, Design, and Fabrication. Next, we have Fatima Nasrahali. Is a, she's a PhD candidate in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at Drexel University. Her doctoral research utilizes hydrologic and hydraulic modeling tools to simulate historical and future compound flood risks in the Eastwick community of Southwest Philadelphia under different adaptation scenarios. She has a, a BARC in architecture from Iran University of Science and Technology, a MARC in architecture from, from the University of Calgary, and an MA in Islamic architecture from George Washington University. She has worked professionally as a project manager, designer, and estimator for various construction and design firms prior to beginning her PhD work. Um, next, John Fernandez is, is director of the MIT Environmental Solutions Initiative. Enlisting the, enlisting the capacity of the MIT community in the transition to a net zero carbon, biodiverse, and equitable future. He is a professor in the Department of Architecture at MIT, affiliated with the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and a practicing architect. Fernandez founded and directs the MIT Urban Metabolism Group and is a member of the World Economic Forum, Global Commission on Biodiverse Cities, the Urban Climate Change Research Network, and the leadership team of Ocean Visions. He is the author of two books, numerous articles in scientific and design journals, including Science, the Journal of Industrial Ecology, Building an Environment, Energy Policy, among others, and author of nine book chapters. He was formerly Chair of Sustainable Urban Systems for the International Society of Industrial Ecology and Director of the MIT Building Technology Program from 2010 to 2015. It is my honor to moderate this panel um, discussion today with Karen. Um, and we'll begin with John. Great, thank you so much uh, for the introduction to the session. I'm really looking forward to the, to the conversation and also to, to my own introduction. So I'm gonna, as I'm talking, I'm gonna be sharing my screen. Uh, um, the goal that I have here today is to meet the aspirations of this this gathering and to talk about simulated landscapes. I'm assuming you can see my my slides. Okay. Yes. Um, I'm going to talk about a few projects and then end with this this project ongoing, this work that we're doing in Colombia. I want to set the stage for the way in which we have approached this idea of 
a new era or epic for understanding nature-human interactions. And there are two components to this. Um, the, the, first, the first component already mentioned, actually both components already mentioned, is that this is, I, I do ascribe to the Anthropocene being the, the, the scientific description of the, of the epic. That's why I added the word epic to the title because it's a geologic epic. Um, I do ascribe to that being a scientifically rigorous description of the shift that we've made. So we no longer can uh, depend on, plan for, be psychologically um, embedded within a stable climate. This is an enormous change. There's, there's the, the idea that stability and the ways that we have understood in the past um, is something that is uh, quickly waning, is the beginning of this new epic. At the same time, almost completely concurrently with th that um, realization is the development of every, a, a huge array of technologies, applied mathematics, um, devices, software, and everything else, um, and also not to not not to forget the commitment to the governmental financing on collecting data about our world in ways that we've never done before. Super high resolution, extraordinary amounts of data. The the cost of memory going essentially to zero, meaning that you know there's no limit to the amount of data and understanding that we have about our world. This is an extraordinarily positive thing. So obviously there are darker sides to this, you know, we won't get into that, but the, the positive is that we know better what's happening in the world today, really in physical terms and otherwise, but in physical, I'm mostly gonna be talking in physical terms than we ever have before by orders of magnitude. And so we are well aware of what's going on in the world today. So this is all within the context of a group that's been mentioned. This is a group that I founded at MIT about 15 years ago called the Urban Metabolism Group. I, re I like, I actually pulled this diagram out of an older presentation because I just like how it kind of resonates with Ian McHarg's work. And this really, it's wonderful to be speaking on, uh, at, the, at the hosting of the McHarg Center because this idea of layering our understanding of the world and being able to account for physical flow. So what we do, typically is we account for the physical flows. So we develop a landscape of flows in time. So a ser time series understanding of landscape, obviously I'm using the word landscape very broadly to mean both the built environment um, and, and, and other things. So this idea of being able to account for physical flows and how they serve our urban and other parts of the economy are central to the work that we do. We've come up with a typology of cities. So this is on the upper left-hand corner, cities that are, that are consuming at very low rates. And generally speaking, these are cities in developing countries. And then at the, the bottom right are those cities that are consuming at very high rates. These radial diagrams only are, are, in, are, are inclusive of a number of resources, fossil fuel, energy materials, and otherwise, and as you can see, as you go from left to right and then down the rows, you get greater and greater resource consumption um, tied to a number of things, climate, socioeconomic conditions, HDI, Gini, and, and other things. We've also now, the thing that I want to introduce in this talk and highlight, because it's central to the Colombian work, is we've launched in the last three, about three years, really major effort in use, using machine learning to take our understanding broadly of landscapes, human landscapes and human nature interactions using machine learning. And it's been extremely productive for us that we, we've come we've had a couple of recent publications and we're gonna come out with a, a whole series of publications in the next year, using machine learning to understand the nature of and the rate of resource acquisition, distribution, consumption, and then waste production by way of urban economies. And, and we've, one of the, the products of this, one of our goals is to 
take the next phase on a clustering of cities, which we now have for some attributes, for socioeconomic attributes so far. So these different colors are basically different city types. They consume resources in similar ways. They also, we haven't done this yet, we're next step, we're gonna be layering on what the climate threats are in these cities and that will inform this clustering. So at the end of the project, which has an ending about a year from now, we will have a clustering of urban typologies, of urban types that tell you about their socioeconomic conditions, physical conditions, um, and the climate um, threats, as well as the climate opportunities for those kinds of cities. Those types will be used to suggest pathways for sustainability for cities. So another project, and again, this is all to, as a prelude to the Columbia work, is we've deployed drone technologies and computer vision and artificial intelligence in very specific ways in this project to um, identify thermal anomalies in the building envelope to be able to essentially survey the thermal landscape of cities. We've actually formed a company called Lamar.ai. This is very specific towards understanding thermal anomalies so that there's more efficient and economic retrofits of cities. But this idea of being able to scan the thermal landscape of the city, the thermal conditions within a city is, is work that we've done. That's at the building scale. And then at the city scale, neighborhood and city scale, we're very much focused on extreme heat. Um, much of the work that you see today is in partnership with a postdoctoral um, staff member, her, her name is Norhan Bayomi, and she is a PhD student of mine, and she's concentrated on extreme heat in her dissertation and developed tools for understanding at a district level the, the risks at a district and then sub-district level, sometimes to the street and the building level, to understand what are the risks to people in different income levels, different ages, and then on the right, this diagram on the right, that's um, the, this animation is to be able to then identify and direct people to coping resources, whether it be a park or whether it be a shelter, um, community center, uh, hospital or whatever under extreme heat conditions. And, and again, under the umbrella of, boy, now we have this extraordinarily deep set of data sets from satellite imagery, from drone surveys and otherwise to be able to be to be able to do this kind of work. Okay, so I think I have, correct me if I'm wrong, but about eight or nine minutes left. Um, so the work in Mocoa in Colombia is work specifically focused on understanding the climate threats for this particular place, this city in, um, in, in Colombia has suffered through a series of very, very large avalanche events um, that have come from the surrounding mountains and, um, and destroyed houses. And the last event just a few years ago um, resulted in the deaths of more than 300 people. So we were, um, we got a grant from the Global Environment Facility, generally speaking, to begin to provide guidance for uh, planning for communities at the, at the human nature interface in the Amazon. So there are hundreds of towns and cities in the Amazon that we are expanding our work to, to understand the climate threats and then to, and then to develop tools to, to guide planning. And part of this is a simulated landscape, producing a simulated landscape. These two images, just to, we've been down there many times. This is what a degraded landscape in the, in the Amazon actually looks like. It's actually, for me, it's quite beautiful, but it's a degraded landscape. This is forest clearing. These are settlements that exist at the edge of the Amazon um, and really have very little resilience and really very little protection from extreme heat extreme precipitation and, and other climate threats. These two photographs show, 
I think pretty clearly that the origins on the right of these landslides from the surrounding mountains um, extended all the way through the city um, during the last event and pulled down many hundreds of houses and as I said, resulted in many deaths. So the work that we've been doing is first we, the, the photograph on the lower right is absolutely essential to my discussion of a simulated landscape here in Mokoa. We have been in Colombia working for now about seven years. We've taken graduate students down um, in practicum studio classes to meet with the community, to understand their priorities, to be able to co-develop, co-create solutions for them. And there are a number of things that have arisen from those discussions. I, I can't get into too much of the detail, but the kinds of co-benefits of addressing this one problem of landscapes uh, of, of avalanches um, at the human nature interface have been extremely important alongside the absolutely essential sense that the community understands that we are committed for the long term. This is not just one project, it's a series of projects and we're gonna stay until we really help them. Okay, so two slides. Where we are now is we've developed a machine learning model where we've taken these attributes, which are readily available from public and some proprietary data sets on the aspects, the elements that might contribute to landslides. You could replace landslides with extreme heat. You could replace it with, um, with extreme precipitation, extreme storms. You could replace it with any climate threat you want. For us, this is a bit of a template to work through how does machine learning really contribute to a better understanding and basically produce a simulated landscape for us that then can be used for better planning decisions. So the on the upper right, you see the actual Google Earth image, which now this is the, the top image is a inventory of landslides um, from the 2018 landslides um, and using uh, local environmental group Corpo Amazonia's inventory of landslides. So those are actual landslides that happen. The the image below um, are uh, yeah that's right. The the image above are inventory of landslides. The image below are the um, expectation of landslides. Now the second slide is the map after having been run through a machine, a machine learning model that we trained um, using all those variables. And the image at the top is the susceptibility from a random forest um, machine learning model. And the image below um, uh, is the corresponding assigned labels uh, for a decision rule of 0.5, so the probability of, of occurrence. So this image here then, is an image that we will be using and superimposing on the current layout of the city and then the planning projections for the city, population growth, and then also um, capital investment, road extension and other infrastructure and using it to guide planning decisions not to place those assets in places where there's high probability of, of landslides. How are landslides connected to climate change? Well, we did a permutation important analysis for the machine learning part. And it told us that rainfall intensity is one of the highest indicators of um, expected future landslides. To be expected, not a surprise, but the machine learning um, analysis actually produced this. So there's an extraordinarily powerful result that tells us that as, a data set for understanding this kind of climate threat needs to include rainfall intensity. The broader, this is my last slide, the broader aspiration for this work is part of another big project, which I'm, I'm, I haven't talked about today, um, that's funded by a group of companies in Asia. And that is to develop comprehensive climate threat portfolios tied to machine learning analysis for a large range of cities. And the way that this connects to the typology is once we do it at very high resolution with a lot of data for certain cities, 
then those cities within that type will tell us about the other cities within that type. And so we can very quickly generalize it to 10,000 cities for which we have data in the global typology. So that's my presentation thing. Oh, actually, one quick word, and I'll just say it very quickly. All of this is having a fundamental sh shift, a fundamental uh, impact on the way in which we're thinking about education. I can say more, more about that in the question and answer period if we get to it. Thank you so much. John, if you, you do have three or four minutes, if you did want to oh, say I do? something okay. about it now. <laughs> okay. I'm being too militant about my time limit. Okay, so I do want to say, and, the, and it will take a couple of minutes, and that is that the Ian McHarg's work and others was, was one of the first instances, although, you know, actually you go back to Vitruvius, and there are also thoughts about this, that the situating, the intelligence situating and management and growth of a city has to take into consideration the environmental conditions within which the environmental context, the landscape, and all manner of dynamic phenomena like prevailing winds. And that's what Vitruvius wrote about. So there's a very rich association now between computer science and urban studies. And at MIT, we have a joint major between computer science and, and urban studies for undergraduates to learn from the very beginning that when you're looking at a landscape, built environment, urban or otherwise, you're looking at a dynamic system that is governed by physical, physical phenomena. So go back to physics and then require a range of of competencies, including gathering data at very high resolution. So this is a class that we just offered over January, the January intercession period, and got great um, participation by undergraduates. And we're expanding this class in the fall to be, how do you use drones and AI, machine learning in particular, in particular, to be able to understand landscapes at various scales, from this scale, the building scale, and the you know dis urban district scale, to regions and whole countries using satellite imagery. Just yesterday, I was in a, in a workshop in which there was extraordinary work shown about the advances in satellite imagery for, for methane em emissions and the ability to bring in these whole wholly new data sets that are a result partly of the microsatellites um, and then again, the drones, but then all, but to be able to bring that data and use it in a machine learning context to understand quickly uh, and economically um, the, the the phenomena that are that that are governing uh, changes in the landscape. That's so. It's a, it, there's an extremely important educational piece of this because it's a shift in the way that planning um, and computer science is thinking about the the their their disciplines. So with that, thank you so much, and um, I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Um, I think next we have um, Elma. Yes, so mm -hmm. let me bring up my screen. There we go, you should be able to see it now. Yeah. Great. Okay, so also from my side, thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, I try to frame my talk a little bit uh, according to the title of this um, symposium, uh, basically going into the instruments that uh, survey and that um, design and also actually fabricate landscapes. So um, I always like to start with this image. Uh, so here the form of the landscape can be explained using a borrowed concept in biology called epigenetic landscapes. Sanford Quinter here explains that the underlying form is understood as a landscape that conditions all forms and actions set upon it. So in terrain, form acts as an ordering action or a certain deployed logic following the laws of least resistance. 
Uh, to quantify form in terrain, various approaches to landform classification can be used to make it available for design. Here, the main problem is not one of precision, but actually one of scale. This terrain is made up of small particles that together create large territories. Uh, however, the focus on form in the design disciplines is shifting to one of performance. It might not be obvious, but in terrain, form itself is nothing but the frozen state of a system in continuous motion. This is nicely illustrated by Matthias Kondol's concept of the conveyor belt. Processes of erosion and transportation move material to be deposited downstream. These processes are in so-called dynamic equilibrium, where small disturbances may have large effects. However, the increase in pressure from urban infrastructure creates these disturbances in dynamic systems, resulting in an increase of natural hazards we witness today. So these natural processes in terrain also determine its material makeup. So in alpine regions, grains have larger and more angular shapes or further downstream, rocks are broken into smaller particles that are more rounded and sorted. This has a direct influence in its mechanical properties. For example, soils with small clay particles can have achieved steeper slopes, while larger particles are more resistant to erosion. As such, every site requires specific solutions based on its sub substance. So here to summarize this kind of conceptual work that I lay out and also kind of an understanding of what it is not about. And we have seen how terrain is not only a material with a form, but is influenced by the natural processes acting on it. So now I want to have a look at the instruments that actually support the design and fabrication of terrain. So of course, this is an old example of these instruments that measure terrain, in this case, the quadrant. And today, maybe when we do this with laser scanners, measuring millions of points per second. So these, influence, these instruments not only influence the way we measure, but also how we perceive, and now I argue also how we make landscapes today. So generally, the information from these survey instruments are stored in digital information systems. Here we see an early example of a surface interpolation. But as these models are specifically oriented towards the storage of information, they are not particularly suited for design purposes. So these models of design, uh, computer-aided architectural software using a free-form modeling paradigm are able to model almost any conceivable shape but lack the possibility of extensive attribute storage that is so powerful in GIS. There's actually a lack of tools today that's specifically geared towards designing with terrain data, although we are seeing it of course convergence. So next I want to talk about the models of fabrication. So before the advent of hydraulic power, the constraint in manual earth moving meant that the underlying form of the landscape had a large influence on how earthworks were embedded and constructed. However, heavy construction equipment today is able to transport and shape large amounts of soils without the need for taking existing specific site conditions in consideration. So this maybe changes slowly with the advent of digital tools. So what we see here is the uh, the evolution of tools from constraint within a box to kind of a larger uh, assembly uh, part. And then now these tools, these robotic construction uh, tools become mobile, which enables for the first time uh, a large scale uh, construction paradigm. So when you see um, this diagram that basically uh, relates to construction machinery to kind of big infrastructural projects of its time with the channels, the railroads, highways, high rises, we can now maybe understand that these robotic construction machines become the tool of uh, uh, the response and kind of the challenges we face today in terms of climate change. So when we look at the, at the construction process, a typical, let's say, um, conventional construction process, it starts with these models of information, the survey, uh, then continues to models of design, uh, the drawing, and then the models of fabrication, which uh, are the machines. Now, when you look at the same process, but then uh, in terms of robotic fabrication, uh, this linear process becomes actually a circular one. So where there is a direct relation between the survey, the design phase and the fabrication phase. And uh, in all cases, either data or a physical manifestation uh, flows between one and the other. And so to realize this, uh, this dynamic loop, 
um, um, my research uh, developed um, survey instruments, design tools, and fabrication tools that I will now go into. And so for the survey, um, there was a need for a, a LiDAR survey drone, which at the time, this is now three years ago, was one of the first to actually achieve this um, in this scale. Uh, that basically enables uh, the capturing of topographic data uh, continuously uh, while streaming it uh, to an excavator or to a robotic platform. And then here you see actually this data, so the raw data coming in and then filtered uh, to be able to easily manipulate it. So that is from the survey side, from the design side, there was a necessity to actually create a, a new modeling tool that would be able to um, allow for uh, incoming uh, streaming uh, top of topographic data. And then here, uh, this paradigm basically co goes from explicit geometry, which is usually uh, understood as these design paradigms and CAD programs to implicit geometry. Where there's actually where shapes are actually encoded as functions instead of um, uh, explicit geometry. And here we see these absolute functions. So by using shapes that are encoded as distance functions, it becomes possible to embed it into a digital terrain model without destroying its data structure. So this enables an endless number of Boolean operations that are difficult to achieve in meshes or NURPS when operating at the scale of landscapes. This resulted then uh, in a, a grasshopper tool that was developed in collaboration with Matthias Bernhard. Uh, that actually um, was not only very helpful for robotic uh, processes, but also for, uh, let's say, uh, conventional landscape modeling. And here you see some of these kind of functions that are there. So importing and exporting of data, then grid translations, and also some generative components. And then uh, let's look at the fabrication where these things start to come together. So in collaboration with Dominic Judd from the Robotic Systems Lab here at the ETH of Mar Marco Hooter, uh, who developed a completely autonomous uh, excavation uh, platform, uh, we were able to, to do these experiments. And so this is then uh, very briefly the overview from kind of a current surveyed elevation map to a desired elevation map and then the cut and fill. And what is important here to understand is that all these processes that you will see in the upcoming video are completely generated dynamically five times a second. So whatever you find as a current elevation map, it always is able to achieve this desired elevation map. And so here you see kind of the preparation phase with the survey, the incoming data, the elevation map, and then here, the first kind of operation. So the digging cycles, the dumping cycles, and at the same time, the kind of uh, constant observation in order to uh, maintain a, a volume balance of zero, because you don't always know how, how much the soil will increase when you loosen it up like this, or what happens when you compact it. And so this, the shape of this kind of embankment prototype in the end, uh, is different from the one that we give the machine because it is actually limited to the material that it finds on site. So here, then we see the robotic embankment prototype, the final form, uh, which demonstrated integration of these models of information design and fabrication. So it achieved this free from geometry without this human intervention responded to unpredictable material interactions during construction. So in a way, this technology is kind of ready to and capable of reacting to natural processes and also at fabrication at a larger scale. Now this, what, you, what I just uh, um, presented was kind of the research part and the kind of te technological part. But in a way, hand in hand with this uh, research, there is always design explorations to somehow uh, hope, let's say, that design and, and or that research by design and experimental research kind of go hand in hand and start to influence each other. And so for these um, robotic uh, landscape design studios that were done um, here with Professor Christoph Figaro and Comatio and Color Research, um, we tried to explore the potential of these kind of technologies, these techn dynamic construction technologies in the landscape. And so what you see here is a valley in Switzerland with an with the debris cone and the river coming down the gorge. 
this next in this next slide it's much more clear and what is happening here is basically a completely uh, dammed and channeled river in order to be able to control um, erosion and sedimentation and so here you see a, a similar view but then uh, stemming from a from a lidar survey that we did ourselves in detail and so what you see here is actually this evolution of this landscape is these check dams that were installed um, where basically there were a lot of uh, iterations of construction and also a lot of rebuilding. And this is actually because after each um, uh, river correction, as they call it here, there was kind of another uh, natural event that actually completely destroyed it and made, them, made it seem kind of um, a very uh, futile to, in, to have these attempts. And this is then... Um, for the, for the ones who don't know what, what the debris flow can do. I think I don't decide. Um, this is uh, basically one of these debris flows on another side in Switzerland, but captured on camera. And you can see uh, kind of the violence um, that it has and that it drags with it. So these gigantic boulders and, and, and uh, basically dry material coming down a mountain. And so in order to... Um, to think about these landscapes and in order to understand what these uh, processes uh, do, which is basically almost a yearly process uh, in, the, in these alpine regions. Uh, we collaborated with the um, Swiss Federal Institute for, for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research in order to simulate them. And so these are uh, physical simulations um, on the actual topography. And as you can see here that the expected landslide already goes uh, beyond the boundaries. And so these were then the objectives, objectives that we set for the studio. So first of all, no more maintenance on these check dams because there's actually uh, no more money to keep maintaining these uh, kind of static concrete structures. Uh, the, the possibility of actually receiving a major event and also the idea that these events occur uh, annually. And so instead of designing a single um, a project actually understanding the design as a series of interventions that actually evolve together with the material that is uh, deposited on the site. And then in the end, we would have, or the, the end that we set for this studio, this 20 years, we would have a local material balance of plus 1 million cubic meters. So in order to experiment with these robotic processes, um, we uh, kind of devised experimentation sandboxes uh, to uh, understand how they uh, how these dynamic material movements can occur. And so we had a spreading and compression cycle, a dumping cycle, and a digging and dumping cycle in order to experiment with these. So it is important to understand here is that we have different tools, so like a deposition tool, a shifting tool, a stamping tool, and also always a 3D camera and uh, sometimes a force sensor in order to interact with the material. And then I think one of the, this is just a demonstration of what it means to uh, work with robotic processes, because what you see here is actually an execution of exactly the same code left and right, but because there is a, a 3D sensor, it can sense the topography underneath. And as you can see on the left, you see a flat uh, plane and on the right, you see kind of a debris cone and the, uh, the robot actually responds to that dynamically and automatically without having to change the code. And so this then becomes actually an extremely creative process that is not only dependent on the digital input that you give as a designer, but also on the physical reaction that it has in the material box itself. And so from here, we extracted then kind of um, strategies on how to be able to distribute material or to create a certain geometry that would then start to come into being by iteration or this adaptive transformation by basically sensing the material and, and then responding to it. So for the dumping cycle, again, a, a similar setup, this time only by a depositing material. Or then uh, we explored uh, dynamic aggregation. So how can you start aggregating material, uh, responding to uh, um, the behavior of the material in the sandbox, integration of uh, certain landforms and also emergent transformation, like unexpected behaviors between the uh, physical and the digital um, material at hand. And then finally, kind of the combined digging and dumping cycle, 
uh, which start to uh, explore uh, this idea of uh, unfinished design. So how can we start thinking about these materials in the future where we actually don't know how they will, if you, while we actually don't know how they will behave in the future. And so then uh, there are, uh, are, of course, this uh, re dynamic redistribution, but also kind of goal optimization, since the goal kind of always shifts forwards, and also open-ended transformations. And what I want to show is just one project uh, from these studios that kind of explains um, how we start uh, working with this uh, idea of the design of the unfinished. And so what you see here is basically the current situation on top, the kind of channeled river, and um, first ideas, so these are very early sketches by the students on, on how to maybe start working with these um, debris flows and how to receive this amount of material uh, differently from creating concrete dams, but with topography itself. And so then this is, let's say, their first sketch. So you see below it's kind of very rough, so the check dams are taken out and there's a certain type of uh, material um, uh, manipulation. Um, which then is basically continuously worked on during the semester. So what you see here is this kind of iterative design between uh, modeling, simulating, and then kind of surveying the result again. And if you look over the whole semester, then you see on the top left kind of their first intuition or this kind of concept design, uh, which uh, dramatically failed. Um, and then uh, if I stop the simulation, all the, on the bottom right, you see kind of how they managed to manipulate the topography in such a way that uh, the material was deposited within the site and also in a controlled and, and regulated manner. And then uh, apart from this strategy of being able to receive this maximum amount of material, also this idea of evolution. So uh, how to transform this landscape over time from this very static and, and maybe not so ecological uh, landscape or very uh, monotone landscape to one that is open, that is uh, that has uh, dynamic processes inside um, and, and basically becomes a very different type of structure in the landscape. All of this, of course, regulated by uh, observation and uh, robotic manipulation over time. And so in section here we see, uh, let's say after year one, this kind of first implementation of one of these structures. And then slowly the landscape starts to grow, trees start to appear. Maybe with some events, some trees will disappear again, but at the same time, um, the, the landscape uh, becomes kind of accessible as well. So when we then look at the, let's say the current situation on top and the new situation below, you see this kind of dr dramatic change in the landscape from something that is um, uh, in a static controlled and one that is open and dynamic. And I think it's important to note that here, this idea of maintenance is very important uh, because without this maintenance, of course, the sedimentation and erosion processes would actually not uh, be in dynamic equilibrium. Um, here again, uh, the plan view of this uh, a very different kind of structure um, and also a visualization of this kind of landscape where actually you can see that the structures are there, but there's actually a certain openness and a certain kind of infiltration of, for instance, agriculture and um, other leisure activities inside this landscape. And I'm almost there. So this is the last one of the last slides. So where basically on top left, you see the program, uh, the project I explained, but also in very different manner, other projects appeared that were also able to receive this material um, without having to consort to uh, static structures. And so to conclude here, uh, what we have now, let's say as a landscape, as I framed it in the beginning, this idea of substance process and form is actually augmented with uh, a different types of process. So where there's not only natural processes acting as gravity in the landscape, but also robotic processes that, be, that become an, an alternate actor in order to keep a safe and uh, dynamic environment. And the last slide is then uh, the book that just came out, which basically um, covers uh, some of the work I showed and more about uh, this possibility of robotic landscapes and the potential of it for design. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Omar. Fascinating. Appreciate it. Um, next, we'll have Fatima.
will be uh, in her video on her behalf. Let me know if there are any issues with it running. Can everyone see it? Looks good. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to present in this symposium, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Just stopped. I know. Um, sorry. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to present in this symposium, and I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us uh, to share our ongoing works and our thoughts on modeling change. So before I get into the main presentation, I'd like to give you a little bit of background and why I think this symposium is a great place for people like me to present their work. Um, so as you know, there has always been this need for landscape architects, designers, and engineers to collaborate communicate effectively and share their knowledge. And I was very interested to be able to understand different aspects of a project. Um, so my academic and professional backgrounds were in architecture and I was essentially an architect, but right now, right now I'm a PhD candidate in architectural slash environmental engineering at Drexel. And for the past few years, I was very much challenged to develop a holistic approach and a comprehensive per perspective in which we consider different aspects of a project such as aesthetics, natural processes, efficiency, technology, and functionality. And that has been one of the driving forces of my research project, which is still in progress, and I will present it today here. So a quick overview of this presentation, I will start from explaining what is HNH modeling, and then the description of our case study, which is East Week a Community southwest of philadelphia and then an illustration of how the model was constructed calibrated and validated and then i will i will move on to the discussion of adaptation strategies and how we are using our model as a tool to simulate those adaptation strategies and evaluate them and i will also show some uh, preliminary results and then i will end with the description of our ongoing work um, such as the application of climate change scenarios and downstream interventions to the model. So what is HNH modeling? Hydrologic and hydraulic modeling. Uh, hydrologic model refers to hydrology, um, basically surface flow processes such as rainfall, infiltration, evaporation, and generation of runoff. In terms of hydraulic model, that is the fluid dynamics, the mechanical behavior of water, uh, such as flow through drains, through outlet, through inlets, pipes, and over beers. So there are some commonly used industry standard HNH models, such as EPA SWIM and the proprietary version of it, which is PC SWIM. And with respect to our research project, we are utilizing PC SWIM. And as I said, that's the uh, proprietary version of SWIM 5, and it's a GIS-based um, decision support system for EPA SWIM. Uh, one of the capability of PC Swim is the ability of the model for modeling of multiple what if scenarios, which is what we are really interested in to evaluate our adaptation strategies. Uh, so moving on to our case study, our case study is East Week, which is a community southwest of Philadelphia. So in this image, you see the entire area of Darby Cobb's watershed. And then if we zoom in into this black box here, uh, we see East Week, um, which is a neighborhood adjacent to Philadelphia International Airport. So there are 42,000 residents in this neighborhood. It's a very diverse community, a peacefully integrated community. There is a strong industrial presence there. It's very well connected to the rest of the city through public transportation. And there is also public space amenities there, such as the John Hines uh, Wildlife Refugee, that, um, which is the country's first urban uh, wildlife refugee. So it's a valuable community. However, there are some key environmental issues um, that East Week is uh, facing right now, uh, including flooding, uh, which is the focus of our research project. Other environmental issues are water-related issues, exposure to pollutants, poor air quality, and there is this issue of sinking homes, which I will get into later on in my presentation. So flooding has been a long-term issue for East Week. In this image, you see a storm that happened in 1933. Um, and um, 
And this is because Eastwick is a low-lying community that is situated between different water bodies. There is Schuylkill River to the east of Eastwick, and there is the confluence of Darby Creek and Cobbs Creek to the west of the community. Uh, and also parts of Eastwick lie within the FEMA 100 and 500 year floodplain. Uh, so the low elevation coupled with the loss of the tidal wetlands, which provide flood storage and storm surge protection, has led to persistent flooding and issues uh, with stormwater runoff in Eastwick. And um, so basically to sum up the causes of flooding in Eastwick, there is this fluvial flooding, which is a stream overflow majorly from Cobbs, from Cobbs Creek to Eastwick. Then there is coastal flooding, which is wind, storm surges, and astronomical high tides uh, that cause inundation of the coastal plain. And then there is this pluvial flooding, which is the intense precipitation that exceeds the infiltration capacity of the soil. So what's happening in Eastwick is uh, this whole situation of compound flooding, flooding as a result of combination of all these different types of flooding. And that has been the motivation of our project. So we were, um, we were interested to develop a modeling tool that can accurately predict flooding in East Peak due to extreme precipitation, storms and surges, and their combined occurrence. And then we were also interested to work with the East Peak community to develop a viable, to develop viable adaptation scenarios and to be able to evaluate those scenarios. So what I'm really focusing on today is our modeling tool. Uh, we wanted to use the modeling tool to simulate the effectiveness of all these different strategies to reduce flood, flood risk in East Week now and in the future. Okay, so um, the construction of our model started from a digital elevation model. And our DM covers the entire area of uh, Derby and Cobb's watershed. Uh, so compared to other studies, to other studies that were focused on East Week, they were majorly looking at uh, East Week itself Whereas we are trying to, um, to see the effect of upstream interventions on East Week. So we are modeling the entire uh, area of Darby and Cobb's watershed, the larger watershed, and we extended that into Schuylkill to the east and Delaware River in the south. And so a small portion of Schuylkill watershed is also included in the model. Uh, then the larger watershed was delineated into sub uh, watershed, and to use the PC swim term, sub catchments. Uh, and then also the drainage pathways were defined in the model. We also use the soil type layer to uh, define the infiltration properties and the imperviousness layer, which is uh, one of the properties of the subcatchments and uh, stream layers to define the drainage pathways and the conduit center lines. Uh, other inputs of the model are the rainfall data and the boundary conditions. So in terms of the rainfall data, Philadelphia Water Department provided us with the radar rainfall, which is a, a spatially distributed uh, rainfall data. So instead of having time series from gauging stations from point gauges, we are using a spatially distributed uh, precipitation data, which is a more accurate representation of uh, rainfall. And uh, here you see the radar rainfall data for Isaias, which is a tropical storm that happened in August 2020. Uh, other inputs are the boundary conditions. There are two bound tidal boundary conditions, upstream and downstream Delaware River, and there is a flow boundary condition, upstream Scorpio. And if you zoom in into, a red, into the red box here, uh, these are the spots that we have the observation data for. So we are trying to get close to the observation data in these three spots. Um, and we are using the observation data for the calibration purposes also. So here is the uh, Cobb's USGS gauge, and we have the discharge and water level, water elevation data for this gauge. Here um, on the left, we have Darby USGS gauge, same observation data. And down in East Week, there is a USGS, USGS gauge at 84th Street, which we have the water elevation data for. So these are basically our uh, spots of interest. In terms of our model verification, calibration, and validation procedures, after we constructed the model, we verified it. So we checked the model for instabilities, we checked the subcatchments for their pool points, outlets, and also we used uh, a stream center lines to verify flow pathways. Then we develop our calibration goals. 
Um, so we ran a continuous simulation from February 2020 to August 2020, and we defined a collection of 35 events within that six months period. And that, those 35 events, they include uh, both extreme events and non-extreme events. And then we analyzed our uncalibrated results. So um, I will show in the next slide uh, a couple of um, scatter plots. So we plotted our predicted uh, versus observed peak flow and total volume of flow for, uh, for both the aging station at Cobbs and at Darby. And we analyzed our results and basically tried to, uh, to evaluate how much close we are to the observation. And same thing, um, we plotted the computed versus observed water elevation at 84th Street. And then there is this calibration process in which we tune our model properties and parameters to get uh, to match our predicted values to the observation values. Uh, and we were focusing on subcatchment width, percent imperviousness, percent routed, junction invert elevations, and infiltration properties. So we tune those parameters to calibrate the model. And then we basically validate the model. So this is a work in progress. We are still in. Uh, process of calibrating and validating the model. But basically the goal is, the goal of validation is to quantify the accuracy of the model by simulating other known historical conditions. So we calibrate the model to a subset of events. And then once we feel confident, uh, we validate the model to other subsets of events. And then we, we will be simulating, uh, we will be using the model for future uh, scenarios and for forecasting. So this is an example of, uh, of the scatter plot that I mentioned earlier. So here you see that the computed uncalibrated volume of flow is plotted uh, against the observed volume of flow. Uh, there are 35 dots here. Each dot represents an event. And this solid line here is a one-to-one -one line. And so basically, the closer the dots are to this center line, um, the model is in a good shape. So you see that we are, the model is doing decent here with the non-extreme events. And there is a suggested range per the guideline. Uh, so when we are looking at the scatter plot of volume of flow, uh, either we need to be right onto uh, the one-to-one -one line or within this range of plus 20% or minus um, 10%. So as you see with our extreme events, which is the Isaias, a tropical storm that happened in August 2020, as I mentioned, and one other extreme event right before Isaias, the model is not doing good. So we are trying to calibrate and get close to this range with the extreme events. Um, so this is the analysis of the uncalibrated results. And then when we get to calibration, we tune some subcatchment parameters, um, such as imperviousness, and infiltration properties, and we were able to get to get Isai as one of our extreme events uh, within the range. So these are all uh, preliminary results, and this is a work in progress, as I said, uh, but I just wanted to show you an example of how our um, calibration and validation process work. Okay, so in terms of flood risk uh, mitigation options, um, how we can reduce flood risks in East Week? Uh, there are some solutions, some proposals, such as upstream in interventions, which is uh, watershed restoration, including green stormwater infrastructure and stream restoration. And there's this idea of downstream interventions, uh, which is basically um, providing protection in the community itself. And that includes um, building a berm or levees, uh, abandoning flood pro areas, which is not of our interest and community's interest. And also there is this land swap proposal, which is still in, uh, in a conceptual phase, um, but basically relocating people within the community itself. So our goal is to use our model to evaluate uh, these, these adaptation strategies. Um, so starting from upstream interventions, this is a screenshot of the model. And as you see, um, the model is delineated into subcatchments. Um, so each subcatchment has uh, different properties, including percent imperviousness and perviousness. Uh, so the question here is that how we can mitigate flooding in East Week and how we can reduce flood risk in East Week by intervening um, in upstream of East Week. So what if we 
what if we reduce, what if we play with this imperviousness person, uh, we make the upper stream of East Week more permeable, um, what, what would happen in East Week if we do that? So this, um, this map here, it represents uh, the total amount of precipitation for Isaias. The darker green, the darker red represents um, like uh, more precipitation. Uh, so as you see, most of the precipitation and rainfall occurred off a stream of Darby and Cobb's watershed, but the flooding happened in East Peak downstream. So the idea here is that what if we hold this water here off a stream in the watershed and we prevent it from um, getting or overflow to East Peak? And one way of doing this is that we make the watershed, the upstream of the watershed, more uh, permeable. Um, so what we did is that um, this highlighted area of the stream of Darby Cobb's watershed, we changed the imperviousness here. And we used our model to see how that impact the flow at the Cobb's gauging station. And here are some uh, sample results, preliminary results. So this chart is to demonstrate the sensitivity of downstream flooding to watershed imperviousness. The blue chart, the blue curve um, shows the existing condition. And then if we increase um, the imperviousness of the Cobbs watershed by 25%, we get an increase of the peak flow by 27%. And that's represented in orange. So both volume and peak flow of the Cobbs gauge is going to increase if we increase the imperviousness. But if we, if we decrease the imperviousness by 25%, that's going to reduce the peak flow by 16%. That's the yellow curve here. So you see that there is, uh, there is an impact on um, the flow at Cobbs Creek um, if we intervene with the imperviousness of watershed, both uh, at, um, so I'm just showing the Cobbs results, uh, but um, this effect is also seen at Darby. So another um, another scenario is um, basically how how can we how can we increase or decrease imperviousness of a stream of the watershed? That is through the low impact development uh, controls and different ways of applying it to the model is that as I mentioned for a subcatchment there is these properties of imperviousness. So a subcatchment is divided into two areas of impervious and pervious, and we can add this low impact development control has a portion of pervious area, impervious area, both pervious and impervious area. We can replace each of these impervious and pervious area by completely by a low impact development control. Um, and our approach here is that we, we are going to treat our impervious area. So a portion of the impervious uh, surface of the subcatchment will be treated by low impact development uh, control. And uh, there are different types of those LIDs. Uh, the one that we started uh, simulating and sort of evaluating in the model is the bioretention cell. So as you know, uh, bioretention cells are depressions that contain vegetation grown in an engineered soil mixture that is placed above a gravel drainage bed. And then it uh, provides a storage, infiltration, and evaporation of both rainfall and runoff captured from surrounding areas. So this will uh, help us with maintaining, with maintaining and holding the water off a stream in the wa watershed and preventing it from overflowing into East Peak. So we were curious how much this LID control is going to be effective and impact um, in reducing flooding in East Peak. Um, so as you see, um, we treated 42% of uh, impervious area of uh, upper stream of the watershed, Darby Cobb's watershed, with bioretention cell LID control. And that reduces, that reduced the volume of the flow and the peak flow at Cobb's gate. So um, the existing condition is represented in blue. And when we added the bioretention cells to upper stream of East Week in the watershed, we, um, we see that the flow is reduced. And all these results are for Isaias, uh, the tropical storm, uh, which is considered, it was specified as a 10 year storm later on. And uh, we had the observation and the simulated data for that. And we are comparing it uh, to the scenario in which we, we applied the LID control to the model. So in our modeling efforts, uh, next step is basically improve the model. Uh, and that would relate to the calibration and validation procedures. 
Then we continue to simulate and evaluate upstream in interventions. We are going to uh, also evaluate other LID controls in the model and um, see how increasing or decreasing those in uh, upstream of the watershed would impact flooding in East. Week. Also, we are going to simulate future climate change scenarios and evaluate downstream interventions um, like the land swap proposal uh, considering the future climate change scenarios. So just to give you an idea of that, um, there is this uncertainty in future climate, um, both in terms of precipitation and sea level rise. So we looked at different organizations and <clears throat> sort of their, uh, their method of uh, forecasting future. Um, so in terms of precipitation, there is this delta change factor approach in which uh, we can apply a multiplier uh, to the existing precipitation time series and um, sort of predict the future um, climate change um, and its impact um, in the future. So um, we came up with these uh, three values of 10%, 20%, and 30%. And we are going to apply these uh, 10, 20, and 30% to our radar, radar rainfall and um, sort of increase precipitation in the model and um, see the impact of that in East Week and flooding in East Week. Uh, other components of climate change is uh, sea level rise. Again, there are these uh, three different scenarios of sea level rise projections, um, increasing um, sea level by 12 inches, 36 inches, and 72 inches. And um, that will also be applied to the model um, to see the impact of it on flooding in East Week. So in terms of the downstream intervention, we had we ran a survey um so dr montalto uh, my advisor he had um, a course last spring and they ran a survey with um east Bay community and they asked them whether they are willing to uh, moving out of their home due to flooding and you see um if you add uh, the yellow portion to the red portion there's almost 80 uh, percent of the community who are who are willing to um either move out of their their home or they might consider that so there is this uh, proposal, which is in the uh, concept uh, phase still, of uh, moving people from lower elevation in the community to higher elevation. Uh, so what you see here is the 100-year and 500-year uh, floodplain in East Week. And uh, the red dots represents people who have experienced flooding in East Week. And we are considering in this proposal to move people here to higher elevation in this uh, in the in East Bay community. Um, these uh, boundaries are the city-owned lands, so there is this idea of um, sort of um, buying out these parcels and uh, transitioning these lower elevations into wetlands. Um, so this is again is uh, very conceptual. Uh, but um, it's under consideration. Uh, there is also this area of sinking home up in East Week. Uh, so in terms of the land swap proposal, uh, if we add this area of sinking homes to the area of homes that are located in lower elevation in East Week, there is approximately 600 vulnerable homes. And <clears throat> there is one uh, 87.6 acres of vacant city-owned land uh, here in higher elevation. So the idea is uh, how we can relocate people uh, from this lower elevation to the higher elevation. Uh, so with this proposal, we, also, we are also going to consider different sea level rise scenarios. Um, so this is our area of interest to move people to, and this is um, existing condition. And uh, if we add one foot of sea level rise, that's how this area is going uh, to be impacted. Uh, with the mid-century high-end scenario, three feet of sea level rise, um, that's the result. And then um, with basically the worst case, late century high-end, six feet sea level rise, uh, still you see this is less impacted compared to other parts of the East Week. Um, so that's one other reason that this is our area of interest. And we are going to um, evaluate all uh, these scenarios using the model. Um, so basically, uh, we're going to convert this area to wetlands, develop this area in the model, and see how um, it impacts uh, flooding in East Week.
Um, so that's all for today and thanks for your attention. Fantastic. Thank you, Fatima. Um, and last, we'll have uh, uh, Robert Petrusco. And uh, Keith, Keith is going to play uh, my video for me. Great. Thanks, Thank Keith. You. Can everyone see, still see my screen? No. No, OK. Can you see my screen now? Yes. OK, great. Hi, everyone. I'm Robert Petrusco. And um, before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to quickly thank Karen, Keith, Sean, and Billy for all the time and energy they put into organizing these events. Uh, it was clearly a big undertaking, and uh, I'm personally very grateful and excited to be involved in the conversations. So just jumping right in. All right, models. So when thinking about models, we might be, consider something like this one as an example. Here we have a computational simulation that attempts to visualize a complex process. In this case, the far-reaching radiation plume from, uh, from Fukushima. It's hopefully revealing something about the dynamics and densities of the process, forecasting where it might be in the future, and in general, attempting to discipline an unwieldy nature into a representation that we can interpret. This approach brings up important question about a model's correspondence to the external reality it is trying to represent and the accuracy of the figure that it paints on our screen. For both sincere and cynical purposes, questioning the accuracy of a model goes hand in hand with modeling itself, especially if we imagine it as a representational activity. And this is indeed an important aspect of all model making and model interpretation. Today, however, I'd like to discuss another aspect of models, not focused on what models represent or how well, but instead focused on what models do, the effects they have on the world, and how their inner workings change our mental concepts, our intuitions, our imagination, and even our ways of governing society. It is in this sense that I am thinking of models as imaginal machines, and I'm relating it to the concept of the social imaginary, first described by philosopher Cornelius Castoriadis, and further elaborated by sociologist Stephen Shukaitis. Rather than over-theorize this term, I'm going to read an extended quote by Shukaitis, because it distills very well my interest uh, in this term. Okay, so the social imaginary, he writes, is not a network of symbols or a series of reflections. It is the capacity for symbols and reflections to be created in the first place. It is in these shared capabilities, these shared capacities, and their ability to give rise to new forms of what is thinkable, of new social possibilities or organizations, and new modes of understanding. So with that ambition in mind, uh, let's look at one example that we are all familiar with. In March 2020, as the COVID pandemic reached uh, the U.S. with full force, we were all asked to go into lockdown. That is, to isolate, to socially distance, to wear masks, etc., all the rest of it. And the directive came from the Center for Disease Control as part of an effort to, quote, flatten the curve. Alongside this directive were diagrams that showed a curve of simple exponential growth and decay set against a horizontal line, a boundary condition. The image was seemingly the output from a very simple epidemiological model. It communicated powerfully that if we let the pandemic run its course, there would be an explosive growth of cases. The influx of sick patients would overwhelm the carrying capacity of the healthcare system uh, which was measured in the number of hospital beds, ventilators, and doctor-to-patient ratios. The diagram, however, also offered an alternative. Through lockdown measures, we could flatten the curve and thus take the model in another direction, one that did not exceed the system's carrying capacities. To align the world with this diagram, we engaged in a massive reconfiguration of our daily life, of our economy, of our modes of communication, everything. A model, and perhaps equally significant, the imagery coming out of a model determined our collective behavior. Now, for many people, it has been very important to assess the accuracy of the model, certainly for epidemiologists who need to track COVID as best they can. Others, of course, have also been tracking the model's accuracy, unfortunately not to improve the model, but for cynical political reasons. 
For me, it's not the specific tuning of the model parameters and how well it tracks the pandemic that is of interest. Instead, I'm curious about how its basic ontology affects our collective intuition and our resultant behavior. To be influenced by the flatten the curve diagram does not require it to be numerically accurate. And in fact, if we think closely about these diagrams, they aren't actually uh, model outputs. They're instead depictions of how the models conceive of the world. That is, as rates of change, as exponential growth and decay, and as carrying capacities. The specific distribution of the model's actual curve might change, but it would always grow exponentially and decay exponentially. All of our official policies, our personal policies, our mask wearing, washing our groceries, all of it, has been collectively directed towards altering the rates of that growth and decay. So for me as a designer, it's more interesting to understand how models and their representations of the world have an effect on that world, how it alters our forms of governance and our personal behavior, and indeed our intuition. So let's think about the pandemic then in, the, uh, in a positive light for a moment. Flatten the curve was a call for empathy, for imagining the impact of our actions on a vast network of strangers, healthcare workers, those with immune deficiencies, and even just people who happen to be a few decades older than us. In this way, exponential growth as a concept produced a reconfiguration of society based on our concern for others. And this came from the models that we used. And at least this is how I'd like to imagine what this collective experiment has been about. So said in a slightly different way, in more technical terms about models themselves, in addition to asking how well our models represent the world, we might also ask an opposite question. In what ways have we configured our world seemingly to better conform to our models? When connected with larger geopolitical narratives, we can see that the operation of environmental models directly affected how we think of and represent the world, especially in the case of land cover. Though seemingly neutral, some of these data were directly informed by the ontology of stocks, flows, and exponential growth. And the researchers who designed these categories did so to make the world easier to incorporate into dynamic models rather than to accurately represent the world itself. So let's consider this model here, World 3. This was a systems dynamic model uh, developed by Jay Forrester at MIT, used by Danella and Dennis Meadows, and popularized by the Club of Rome in their 1972 book, Limits to Growth. World 3 visualized a dense system of linear differential equations and highlighted the relationship among population growth, food production, mineral extraction, and hundreds of other parameters. Through a depletion of resources, an explosion in population and the lack of appropriate food sources to meet it, the model predicted a collapse of the world system and by extension, massive hardship and civil unrest. This collapse so far hasn't occurred, which darkly is why the model has been considered a failure. And debates about this failure largely focus on its representational correspondence to the world, its accuracy. What did it get wrong? What did it not take into account all of this? So to think of the model as an imaginal machine changes this discussion. Pinning the model's failure on representational accuracies uh, misses the possibility that the model had an effect on the world in which it was tending to represent and forecast. Limits to growth, for instance, circulated in popular media and was discussed by scientists and policymakers alike. The model made people think in terms of exponential growth curves, about complex nonlinear interactions, about carrying capacities. And this comment isn't a sleight of hand. It actually bears out directly uh, historically. The common explanation for limits to growth failure was that it did not take into account changes in technology that allowed then called developing nations to feed their growing populations. These technologies being advances in crop genetics, techniques for dealing with crop pathogens, and better matching between grains and soil. This collection of practices has been labeled the Green Revolution. Arguments like this, however, assume that the Green Revolution and the limits to growth were not at all related. The archives, however, uh, tell a very different story. The Green Revolution was not solely a project of altruistic science. It was a project of US foreign policy with strong connections between the USDA, the USGS, and the State Department, also the CIA. Indeed, one of the Green Revolution's major figures uh, seen here was plant pathologist Eugene Stackman. Uh, 
he, um, Stackman, had been working on projects supported by the State Department and the CIA as early as the 1950s. As a tool of foreign policy, the Green Revolution was deployed strategically by the United States in countries uh, that they believed were at risk for political destabilization and therefore susceptible to communism. Now, intelligence analysts in the CIA and the USDA identified and forecasted which countries might become destabilized using the World 3 model. And in the early 1970s, the CIA met with both Jay Forrester and Dennis Meadows. The latter gave lectures at the agency and taught analysts how to create models and how to use them within the newly formed Systems Analysis Group. Declassified intelligence reports from the era demonstrate uh, a comfortability with the language of models, often describing the world's populations and resources as growing or depleting stocks in danger of overloading the environment's carrying capacity. By influencing the worldview and mental concepts of intelligence analysts and foreign policy experts who were directly involved in the Green Revolution, the World 3 model and limits to growth seemingly created the conditions of their own failure. It wasn't just how analysts conceptualized the world that was at stake. The ontology of systems models flowed through numerous other uh, adjacent agencies and is embedded in numerous forms of environmental media that we use in our work. In 2015, I conducted a research project funded by the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. Um, and this project explored the genealogy of the National Land Cover Dataset. The changes in this nomenclature over time uh, show something counterintuitive if exploring it through the lens of accuracy. There are numerous deletions, new aggregations, new bifurcations. There's a ton of uncertainty about what the categories mean. And this uncertainty indicates that the categories are responding to forces other than correspondence to the ground. I highlight this not as a tangent, but specifically in relation to the larger story about conforming the world to models rather than the other way around. The geographers who created the land cover categories uh, used in NLCD were in direct conversation with the CIA, attempting to develop tools that use Landsat for intelligence operations over foreign territories. And specifically, they created categories that could uh, translate the landscape into dynamic system model parameters. The category of urban is especially indicative here. In the tones and textures of Landsat imagery, US geographers studied the spatial extent of 26 cities. They attempted to use these image patterns as proxies for population counts, a required measurement for tracking potential population changes within the World 3 model. The USGS's publicly stated justification um, of conducting urban research using Landsat data was to, quote, study urban expansion, project future population densities, and assess environmental impacts resulting from gradual and catastrophic changes in these densities. Now, catastrophic changes would definitely be alarming. However, U.S. cities at the time were suffering from the opposite tendencies. Their populations were dwindling. One of USGS's main sites for the study, Washington, D.C., for instance, shrank by nearly 120,000 people between 1970 and 1980. In internal reports, however, the intention for the data is presented more clearly. In many underdeveloped nations, census data are inadequate or lacking, they wrote. Synoptic coverage coupled with ground samples will permit highly improved census estimates over large areas of the Earth and thus simplify calibration and verification of analytical models of geographic growth and diffusion. It becomes clear that the land cover category urban is not intended for use within the U.S., nor is it intended to capture something about urban conditions as they are experienced on the ground. Instead, a monolithic and spatially bounded entity that was officially called urban could be read visually, measured and treated as a proxy for population in geopolitically inaccessible areas, and ultimately used in analytical models. Um, so this relationship between Cold War political ecology, environmental modeling, and land cover classification, I think these all circle each other and connect to each other in profound ways. And they provide the underlying basis for a lot of the data that we use today. So this is um, specifically interesting to me. In this final section, I'd like to think speculatively through the mechanisms that the World 3 model has established, that is, through stocks, flows, and change, as well as through the relationship between uh, food sources, population growth, and land use. 
In the CIA's use of the World 3 model, population growth was seen almost categorically as indicative of something negative. And in this case, I'm hoping to use a similar model to imagine population growth and decline as something tied symbolically to the landscape instead. This experiment is inspired by numerous ethnographies that were contemporaneous with the limits to growth, especially those that found positive reinforcement between societal structure and a community's local ecology. The studies by mid-century anthropologists conform conceptually to the worldview created by dynamic systems, and therefore lend themselves to a contemporary framing that can be simulated and used not for modeling fully accurate representations of societies, but for thinking through what societal functions would even be. For instance, dynamic modeling of the relationship between the intensity of agricultural cultivation, soil fertility, and possible caloric yields in a setting without nitrogen-based fertilizer requires a different relationship to land ownership. Here we can see that intensity is greater than uh, one year of cultivation per 16 years drastically alters the sustainability of the system. The relationships and results uh, that emerge require a different intuition, than, um, and this is an intuition that one can learn through the model. Here we see that the yields get depleted in a way that might be um, hard to anticipate uh, if it were not for the model. It also implies other ways of organizing social relations. For instance, in a setting like this, where long refractory periods are needed to rebuild the soil's fertility, privately owned parcels of agricultural land would likely lead to starvation. There needs to be a collective use of the land, an organization uh, where uh, calories are provided by moving to, uh, um, moving to more fertile soil. But let's return to the model. We see through the feedback structure a rather conventional relationship. A larger population requires more calories and therefore more intense cult cultivation. More intense cultivation lessens the yield of any one plot and requires a spatial expansion. The amount of calories produced then affects the birth rate both positively and negatively. So what the inner workings of this machine produce is a situation of growth that does not, a gradually, uh, does not gradually accumulate stress. And we can see this in the diagrams um, on the bottom. Instead, growth produces um, a situation where there's no indication that collapse is coming. Everyone eats until a catastrophic moment after which no one eats at all. Now again, with such a model, it isn't a question of how accurately it models a specific agrarian condition. Like the flatten the curve diagram, it shows in a temporal way how such systems grow and the suddenness of their collapse. It invites us to imagine other regulating mechanisms that connect uh, population density and cultivation in a symbolically meaningful way. And for me, this interest, um, this sort of symbolic formation is the creation of uh, new social institutions that make this connection between cultivation and, um, and birth rates. So these new social institutions, um, this, the design of these have been a radical part of the landscape architecture imagination for several decades and certainly was foundational to many projects um, by Superstudio, who are an inspiration for this, uh, the, this particular project. And I'm just going to show one example of how a new institution might play out. Okay, so here in this version, family size and the amount of land being cultivated each year are connected in a way that provides an overall stability to, to the system. Specifically, if the number of acres increases above 200, families choose not to grow until the fertility of the soil recovers and fewer acres can be plowed. When that occurs, families grow again. The two characteristics oscillate around each other. We can see that on the bottom where sort of roughly stable, but they're actually moving quite qu quickly back and forth. How might such a simple and synthetic relationship inform our imagination? I mean, this is just a model. But the spatial activity here, I have to say, so we're seeing this on the screen, the spatial activity here, as in the previous model, is intentionally abstract. And the, per, uh, the precise spatial expression of this, if it were to become a design project, would be a, another design entirely, one that could feed back into the model. For the moment, however, the visualizations depict the model states in a very simplified and straightforward form. Regardless, it still results in thinking through some new possibilities. We could imagine a community where specific patterns of cultivation communicate to everyone 
that the relationship to the landscape is healthy. Now, <laughs> I'm, this is a bit of a joke showing a crop circle, but I think it gets, gets the point across a little bit that patterns in the landscape, specifically a pattern of cultivation that requires less than 200 acres, could communicate symbolically to the community. So if the relationship between the community and landscape is healthy, there would be a pristine and clear pattern. However, should the pattern become visually disrupted out of necessity to over farm, it could be clearly seen by all community members who then understand the future potential for a collapse because there is no other way to anticipate it. If we recall from above that everyone eats until suddenly no one eats. With this one simple example, the model dynamics imply a way to think about the symbolic function of land use and land cover for communicating the state of complex social and environmental interactions that would otherwise be invisible and invisible until it was too late. And it's with this in mind that I'd like to return briefly to the social imaginary and of thinking of models as types of imaginal machines. The imaginary is a collective mental model held by a particular society. It shapes the individual's imagination for how they fit into the world and what their potentials are. It establishes expectations for how things unfold naturally and as a result for how things ought to unfold. As political scientist Chiara Botticci elaborates, the social imaginary is deeply entangled with images that reinforce a particular perceived horizon of possibility. With a new image that comes from a new speculative use of our models, new expectations for how the world ought to unfold, circulate, and take root. And I believe this is something quite dire in our current moment of climate crisis. Um, I think I'm at the uh, end of my time here, so um, just want to thank you for your uh, attention and again to the organizers for allowing me to share some of my work. Thanks so much. Fantastic. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Um, I think we can um, get into a few, few questions here for the um, panelists. Um, for everyone um, attending, Feel free to also put um, questions into the Q and A, and we'll we'll begin to pull questions from there um, in, in just a moment. Um, Karen, I, I might start with kind of a over, overview question that kind of keeps things very broad, and then we can start getting into some specifics from from there. And I'll let you take over after this. So um, maybe just to, to start out here, and, and you know, um, uh, Bobby kind of picked up on some of this also, but. Um, each of you takes on modeling in very different ways. Um, in Fatima's case, the um, model optimizes a described system and the, de and the definition of the system, and then subsequent tuning is, becomes of utmost perform um, importance. Um, John, uh, on the other hand, is uh, in, in a lot of the work is searching for patterns, um, deploying, mo deploying models as a lens to un unpack these kind of unseen connections between um, biodiversity and settlement, but he's calling it a human nature connection. Um, in Elmar's work, it's, it's, it's often reflexive and requires uh, in situ material conditions to drive these ongoing interactions. Um, this is what I would say is a method that collapses the description of landscape into real time decision making, um, all the way down to the scale of the particle, um, and, and really looks at um, the, this idea of uh, design situated within um, protocols. And then um, also, if you know, in this, if models then have this capacity to shape the world we operate with, then um, as we've seen in many cases, such as the Mississippi Basin model, I'd say Bobby is arguing then for design to be situated um, within the process of model making itself, and that then that the artifact um, then 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 is is within within this um, model. So part of this then, um, I'll say that within each of these approaches. I, I read this under an underlying representational agenda, sometimes more hidden in, than, than in others. Um, it's descriptive of very specific phenomena um, and, and or environments. Um, but importantly, it asks, and this is where I think design, you know, it, it's important for design. Importantly, it asks for human intervention or interpretation to make decisions, to develop these protocols, um, or in, in this last case, to expand our imagination. So I might ask, you know, um, for each of you to kind of build on this notion, right? Um, do you find that the representation or description is central to your approach? Um, and, and how are you seeing in your work this description um, creating uh, an evolving design intuition um, that might influence your, your own methodologies, design practice more in general, or even um, sociocultural perception of the, of the environment through, through the model making? 
I know that's very open, but I think it lets everyone kind of have a have a have a, have a piece to put into that. So I don't know if someone wants to jump in. Uh, happy to jump in to start things off. You can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so very interesting. First of all, very interesting to be on this panel. Really super impressive to see the work and and well done to collect these different perspectives on models. Well done to the organizers. Um, to begin with, the representation and the, and the intervention um, by way of the human actor is absolutely um, embedded within the creation, the development, the completion, and then the application of the results of models. Uh, there's, there's sometimes I think we, we talk a little bit too much and, and especially in the AI machine learning world about how the model's doing everything. And, and the reality is, especially in our work, um, there has to be ground truthing, there has to be verification, there's you know, the ton of work to be able to get to a point where the model itself, in the end, it feels less like a machine than a thing that you've designed and crafted, right? That's it. So, you know, anybody who's built models knows that it's a very labor intensive, hands on thing. And I'm an architect. And I've built lots of models by hand, you know, for decades now. It feels more like that than, than engineering and fabricating a machine that then is independent of humans. That's that's I mean, despite despite Ilmar's work, um, which I think maybe gets closest to that. So I think the 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 thing that I'm picking up from your question is that the simulated landscape that we produced by, by way of machine learning is one additional tool, one additional perspective on the planning process and will be in, inevitably part of socioeconomic, cultural, uh, all sorts of other considerations, private land ownership, land tenure issues, all part of that. And I think that's where we, or you know, I'll speak for myself, where our team feels like the, the interaction with the community in a very deep and sustained way over many, many years is absolutely essential to any model having any kind of legitimacy in the real world. And, and I mean legitimacy in, in both in the technical, but then also in, in the sense of acceptance and and interest to deploy the results of a model in the community. So I'll leave my comments at that. Thank you, John. Are there other takers? <laughs> yeah, sure, maybe I can chip in a little bit. So I think um, in terms of these models in a way, and, and this is very much kind of also uh, responding to John, it's really, the design in the end as a designer is, is, is not only the kind of outcome, the shape and the, the landscape, right? But it's actually in the model itself. So the model itself starts to become kind of part of the design or the code itself starts to become part of the design. And this is especially true when you think the way at least or how, or how I work with these models is actually not um, that the model is kind of an eternal truth for this project, right? But that the model actually itself evolves together with the landscape over time. And so then, as you think about think about this with models, it actually means that um, yeah, that you know that that the model itself is at the moment of conception is kind of uh, in a way irrelevant because you know the years that come after is basically kind of a continuous transformation. And so maybe instead of you know a drawing or a representation of the model, it's actually more the code that un that lies underneath and that can can change and can adapt and can kind of accept uh, different uh, views and different um, kind of insights that happen in the future. I think that's the most, in a way, the most important thing that they, they stay flexible and, and adaptive, yeah. Thanks, Omar. Yeah, I could, I could maybe jump in here too, because I, I know, um, you know, certainly with models and um, my, my background also in cartography, um, the, the question of representation is um, crucial. And I think for me, I, I've gotten, um, I've always tried to parse out what it is that design contributes. And I, we all have different answers to that. Um, and especially as someone 
who you know previously was in an engineering background, I, I often have a bit of an anxiety about what it is that I'm doing differently now than what I did before. And I think the thing that always drew me to design was that um, uh, it had uh, it circulated in culture differently than uh, than uh, technologies that I was working with before. And I, I'm not trying to imply a value system at all. I, um, I actually miss a lot of the work that I was doing before. But the thing for me is that I, I've been excited about how um, there are certain models that are shaping governance and shaping our collective behaviors that I was, I was thinking the other day about how quickly, and this is a negative thing, so just bear with me, but let's think of it as an anecdote, how quickly um, the sort of violation of like mask etiquette or um, social distancing has a visceral ref, um, effect for all of us now. Like I actually feel it in my gut. There's, there's a change in my intuition for what appropriate behavior is. And in, ch in chasing that, that line of thinking down, I was realizing it's coming from the way that the world is represented right now, densely networked um, and uh, you know, a system of, of spread that comes from uh, exponential growth. And I was thinking how just in general, an imagination for exponential growth, if we all had an intuition for that, then debates around climate change wouldn't be so fierce because people, um, everyone in the world would have a sense of the way that scientists are talking about things. Meaning that like scientists right now have a hard time communicating precisely how these systems are working that um, will build upon each other and collapse very quickly if we don't do the correct thing. And I was thinking about how just simple diagrams like flatten the curve within a pandemic actually changed the way we felt in our gut about what, our what effects our behaviors had in the world. And to me, I, I just feel like that non-representational aspect of models, the kind of rhetorical or cultural aspect of models was kind of becoming crucially more important for me than how accurate a model represented the world. So the models I was presenting today, it's more interesting to me that they get one thinking about the ontology of exponential growth and carrying capacities rather than uh, the way that they map onto the specific project or problem that they seem to be modeling. And it's, Maybe I'm putting too, too fine a point on it. It's, you know, I get lost in the weeds, but I, I feel like there's a distinction that are worth teasing out. And if designers are interested in the kind of rhetorical capacity of their representations and things that they put out in the world, the cultural effects, then this is something that we, sh we should sort of take up. Thank you, Bobby. Fatima, I'm give you a chance to respond if you, if you wanted to, or? I don't know if that really answers this question, but in terms of human engagement interventions and interaction with the models. Uh, so when John was presenting and was talking about generalization of urban typology, I was thinking about the specification of urban typology and how we can specify and localize this typology to a specific city or region of the world. And um, and then I saw that he has a community engagement piece, which is a key component of uh, my research project. So, um, so yeah, I think uh, we as engineers, land landscape architects, we think that we are uh, decision makers and maybe we are but it's basically people who we are uh, making decision for that are the decision makers. So that piece of uh, human interaction and we are as modelers uh, incorporating that in our modeling efforts uh, was really uh, interesting and important, I think. Thank you. Sharon, yeah. hand over, hand over uh, to you. Okay. Um, I'm also noticing some questions are getting answered and um, then they move out. I might pull some back that have been answered for the benefit of everybody to hear. Um, but anyway, I thought those were just amazing uh, array of presentations and we're talking about such different kinds of models. Um, and landscape architects are very familiar with starting on a geographic scale um, and testing maybe spatial formations. Um, we often start with the spatial and then move down to the material and temporal. And I thought what was interesting in all of your presentations is the role of the model in integrating all of those. So you're incorporating material property, properties and practices, 
using feedback of changes in volume or configuration of those, and then what the, those relationships are to, to the larger spatial, um, whether that is storm surge or heat sensing, um, watershed scale, and so on. And so this is obviously where computational models and machine learning can do things that we can't do in any other way um, because they can perform simulations for us so we can envision many possible outcomes rather than solutions. So I'm curious if you still find yourself, if some of you looking for optimal solutions with these tools, given how quote unquote smart they are in terms of the amount of information contained within them. Um, all, of the, all of you described the dynamism of these models, looking at dynamic systems to understand processes in time. But of course, the models are still dealing with the inputs and outputs um, and variables that are only set within the model. So I'm, I'm kind of curious how this squares with what John said in his opener about that all of these tools are arising in tandem with increasing uncertainty and instability. Well, I, I can start again, just to just to augment what I said at the, at the beginning of my presentation. You know, I, I am a skeptic of model skeptics. Um, when people, it's very easy to be skeptical of models because they're always imperfect. They're not, they're not perfect representations. In fact, they're never meant to be perfect representations. Um, they're very interesting. I think Bobby, I think that's, um, if you don't mind me calling you that because I heard that before. Um, I thought it was a very, very interesting presentation, albeit one of the first steps at using system dynamics and probably a inappropriately ambitious first stab. So, um, you know, on the other hand, you can laud the researchers for having been that ambitious because since then, and that was, that was 1950s. So that was, that was ancient history on system dynamics. Since then, system dynamics has proliferated and been extraordinarily effective at projections and predictions in useful ways for a huge array of purposes. Um, I've used system dynamics now for about 14 years. I've never been approached by the CIA. So I think, I think the, the beginnings of what, what, what system dynamics was, that history is really, really interesting, but boy, is it, a different landscape today. And that is partly because of the, the democratization to some extent and the availability of data. And so now researchers have the, have the ability not to be the sole author, but to be within large communities using data to develop models for all sorts of purposes. And, and so I'm, I'm very, very optimistic about the the use of models to make a better world by people who have that intent, not just the governmental agencies that were in on the you know first in the first step along with the MIT researchers. So, yeah, I think I'd like to respond to that because I just want to make sure that my my position is being clear here. Uh, my story wasn't that it was a failure. My story was that it was a success. It just was a success through channels that are different than we imagine that when the people who were critical of it in the, in the, uh, at the time were critical of it in terms of its accuracy and its ability to predict failure. But what I was arguing was that if you take that argument off the table and recognize that it affected people in policy, it actually did what it was hoping to do, which was um, prevent a disaster from happening. Also, because of my historical interest, I don't make a value judgment of people who were working with the State Department in the 50s. Um, I know now um, when people bring up the CIA, it usually has a little bit of stank on it, but that's not my intention here either. I mean, I have my own politics that don't align with that, but also to, to do more rigorous historical work about the tools that we're using needs to acknowledge that the people we're talking about had very different values than the ones we do now. So I can't come in and say, ooh, they were working with the CIA, therefore they're compromised. Um, so my story is a bit more about looking at models in a non-representational way still shows that they affect the world positively. So for me, that was actually a success story. I was attempting to recover the world three model rather than, than denounce it. So I just want to make that clear. And John, also, I'm not, I'm not uh, throwing you under the bus with that. This is more for the audience in case anyone- No, 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 absolutely. Okay. And this is a longer conversation because I still would not agree with the idea that, that the world model had very much to do with the green revolution, but that's a that's a different conversation, a different panel. Oh, 
Well, I'm happy to dig out the paperwork and have that conversation yeah. with you. I have sure. stacks of archival material that uh, that uh, would disagree with you on that. Yes, so maybe I can also respond to this question of optimization or kind of you know, that these models display the kind of the truth, right? And I think uh, on a certain level, they, they will present a certain kind of indication of the future, but I think the, the, there's one thing is the simulations of these material processes, right? And how far you can look into the future, which I think is kind of limited. And then, uh, and we will always be limited in a certain way because these dynamic systems tend to, uh, you know, behave kind of um, with, with small disturbances have very large effects. So it's very hard to predict kind of these long, uh, uh, predict these kind of processes over long time spans. So that's kind of on this kind of simulation models, but then on this kind of interaction um, between kind of physical and digital materials, I think there, my work is actually not so interested in kind of precision or trying to, um, you know, create a form that you kind of invented before the, uh, you, you tested it, but actually trying to explore uh, kind of uncertainties and errors and uh, and kind of poetic moments in these sandboxes and in these kind of uh, digital physical interactions that can then become kind of a driver for a different kind of design uh, solution or a different kind of um, uh, formal approach. And so there actually, it's actually the model that you make in the beginning is actually generating something um, or you're looking for something that you actually cannot, cannot kind of uh, in advance model and, and, and coordinate. So it's very much kind of the opposite of optimization. It's actually, uh, yeah, yeah, it's really the reverse. Yeah, I don't know if Fatima wanted to weigh in on that question. Um, I guess I have a related question then um, about accuracy. Um, and given that some of you have described these in terms of their, well, I know Bobby, you of course said accuracy is not the question that models are often judged according to, the, they, they're considered failures if they don't perform accurately, if it doesn't prove to be accurate. Um, but I think Fatima and John maybe talked about it in a slightly different way. Um, Fatima talked about calibrating the model to get it as close as possible to be able to model different upstream and downstream relationships. Um, so I just, given that some of these are, are public facing, like Fatima's work in Eastwick and John, you mentioned how important it is to have the relationships on the ground uh, with the people who are experiencing, will experience changes we make based on looking at our models. How, how do you convey that question of accuracy or inaccuracy um, to the people who will affect on the ground? Well, I mean, I, I have a straightforward answer, which is that you know, when we present to community groups, the um, local uh, environmental organization that we're partnering with, uh, in one of the answers I mentioned, um, indigenous groups and, and especially the elders, um, we, we don't hold back on trying to explain these things. We say, here, you know, machine learning, what is that? And, and, and then we literally go through in terms that sh shouldn't be simplified. You know, there's no reason why um, someone who's never used a cell phone or lives in the Colombian Andes wouldn't be able to understand the basic uh, principles behind the machine learning. And then we also explain the, the results as probabilities and um, but then you know the the main question that was asked in Mokoa was do you want to live in this place or actually the main question that was asked to us was should I build rebuild my house where it was or should I move simple question and our simple answer was well our model shows that within the next five years there's a 90 percent probability that another landslide will affect your house. Simple answer. And that goes, that's a pretty strong message. There's, there's, a, there, there's not much more that we need to do. And then of course, they make their own judgments about it and the planning authorities have their own perspective on it. Um, but that's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward process.
I'll just add one thing. We have to, we always have to work against this, you know, Hollywood type stereotype of the MIT professors swooping in, showing graphs in a model and saying, this is reality. We begin all our presentations by saying, here are the uncertainties. Here's what we don't know. And that actually sets the stage for co-creation of, of a solution because they will then step up and say, oh, actually, let me show you this thing that maybe isn't in your maps that maybe will affect you know, the recommendation that you're making. So I think that we always have to work against that. And I think it is our responsibility to work against that. Okay. Will you? And also jump in here. So, um, so yes, there is a certain level of uncertainty with all these tools. And um, but like John, I'm optimistic, and I think those tools are improving, they're evolving, and um, and in fact, even with the observation data, there is also uncertainty and a question on the accuracy of the observation data. So. We are trying to match our simulated values to observation values. Um, however, there is a level of uncertainty in the observation itself. But I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, holding and continuing to have this conversation with the community, because observations, they don't uh, always come from gauging the stations. They also come from people. So. Um, you know, continue to have this conversation with uh, community and also uh, with the entities that um, sort of uh, manage those observation data, uh, that would help with uh, improving our model um, and getting close to uh, what we need. Thank you. Um, Karen, you, would you want to start picking up some um, questions from the um, Q and A, or sure? Um, or also, if any panelists have questions of each other, we uh, also are interested in hearing those. Um, let's see. I might also um, ask just one question. Put one question out there. Um, one more. This, this is a little bit specific to Elmar to your work. Um, you know, where in some ways the um, the you know the, the process of of kind of reforming the land becomes the model itself, and in, in, in some ways, like the the um, you know the procedures that are going into place construct something. The the um, I guess the the, um, the the kind of the way it's constructed is you know indeterminate, and uh, until like it, it you know until it kind of encounters a, a certain form in the land. Um, in a weird way, like, I mean, this is slightly, you know, esoteric question, but like, you know, in, like witnessing that process tells us something, you know, gives us some new intuition about that, that land itself. And, and which I, I find very interesting, but also the, the end product is, um, is also some could also slightly be devoid of, of the fact that this other intelligence, right, is, is, is forming the land. And, so always, does it does it matter in, in a way that it's witnessed? Do, um, do you see that in any kind of? I mean, do you have any kind of interest in, in what that might might mean or not mean in terms of like the reformation of, of large territories and, and how we might witness that as human beings or not witness it? If that makes sense. Um, well, I mean, I think I think the the work I showed was very much kind of a you know, in, in kind of arguing for uh, the process itself, right? And, and not so much the, the human being there. Right, right. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think there was also a question in the in the, in the Q&A, you know, the, this idea of, of, of whether these models also incorporate then, uh, you know, other kinds of ecologies like animals and, and, and maybe other, you know, yeah. ideas. And then, I don't know. I mean, for me, in a way, as a, as a kind of a poetic endeavor, it, I would like to um, witness the, these kind of processes take shape, right? And kind of the shape itself still kind of in the end as a designer is something that you uh, have to understand or have to somehow uh, judge uh, on quality, right? Um, 
but I think uh, if we just think about the the health of the planet in a way, it's irrelevant, right? If a human in yeah, the end yeah. and, and yeah. witnesses this or not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a bit of a bit of a greedy question on my part, since my work kind of overlaps in, in, in many different ways with with yours, and I was interested in your your take on that because it's a it's a question that keeps coming up in my mind. Um, Karen, did you have a question from the chat? Um, I can also yeah. There's a in. number of chat questions. Um, if one was asking about the subtle but huge distinction between using models um, for individual decisions. So for example, where to live or move your house out of a floodplain versus those um, of decision makers, politicians, planners, and so on, um, who have to incorporate other sets of variables. So I, maybe this is a question of who the presumption is about the end user or even who the operability of some of these models by people who might not be as versed in these tools or technologies. I, I can start again, uh, which, um, I mean, every single modeling project I've ever been involved in or, or directed in the last 18 years um, identifies a user from very, very early on. System dynamics in particular is a, powerful model type to use as an example, because system dynamics is really, you're not modeling the reality, you're not modeling uh, a, a situation, you're, you're modeling a question. And if you're modeling a question, then who's that question important to? Who, who, who needs an answer to that question? That's where you begin. And then system dynamics is a process of creating an architecture based on what you know, and then an iterative process of returning to that user and asking them questions. Is this, does this seem right? This, this very preliminary result that we're getting, does this sync with your intuition, you know, domain experts or community leaders or whoever. And so that you get to a point where um, the user has been integral and embedded in the model from day one. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a mystery. It's not, if it's a mystery, then, that's what that's you have to ask, ask yourself that question before you do any modeling whatsoever. That might relate a little bit to another question about envisioning, envisioning the intersection between the rigorous type of modeling that all of you presented and the world of non professional landscape models. Video games has given an example, but I think have any of you used models or? Um, where there is a participatory aspect or are you just looking at conditions that are, are far too complex for that? And really, it's using the model. I like how you phrase that, John, about asking the questions. It's not providing a solution, it's asking questions. Um, but just to address this one question from the audience about non-professional users, Yeah, I mean, I, mean uh, I, I love I love those kind of models. Actually, John and I, John, the way you phrase that answer, answer, I think you and I are totally in agreement. Actually, at the core, um, so I probably owe you a beer. Um, I, but, I, I think uh, we should reveal some uh, some disagreements, though. So anyway, <laughs> um, but in uh, in this this question too, I think this gets kind of at the heart of some of the things I care about with models. Is that um, yeah, gaming engines like dig into it. What what can we do with, how do we make them useful and get out of the trap of whether or not they're just accurate, how well they correspond to the thing? How can they help us open questions? How do they foster debate? And here's a, another way that I think cartography is useful. Um, there are certainly maps. When we talk about maps, for instance, there are some that of course need to be highly precise when we're doing survey. But we also have a much broader culture of different mapping practices that are more rhetorical, more experimental, more playful. And I think if we could take that same energy that we seem to um, allow cartography to have all of these sort of um, all of these different ways of being in the world, that if we uh, give that same generosity to models, then suddenly they become rhetorical, they become useful, they become sites of debate, uh, they become ways of positing different questions. And therefore things like game engines come into play as I think very useful models for sure. I, I think um, kind of just jumping in on that point and 
I mean, John, I could say to some degree, if you if you want to be really skeptical, you could say that even before the, the questions get asked, they're in some ways somewhat uh, embedded and limited by the funding institutions that underwrite the projects in the first place. Um, so they've already delimited the kinds of questions that might be asked, um, but in a more optimistic way um, and an interpretation of that, like you talked about a kind of proliferation of, the, of different types of modelers and Rock Bobby is talking about the possibility of all of these different methodologies and modeling really open up the ability of different ethics and interpretations that modelers can engage as they you know, interact and develop these models in a kind of in situ manner. And I think that's what's really interesting about all the presentations is that all the presentations really in some ways show a kind of a deep investment with the places in which the models arise, <clears throat> excuse me. So I think that's a, that's a kind of interesting uh, reflection we might have for the capacity for designers to be part of the modeling community uh, and the importance of that. I think that's more of a comment rather than a question, but somebody could respond if they disagree. Keith, one, one point you brought up, which is very, very relevant here at MIT, is what, what precisely and causally are the factors that play into research questions and research agendas? Absolutely, that's, that's a very, and I, I'm optimistic to say that younger scientists feel that this is very much their responsibility to dive into. Senior, very senior scientists, maybe not so much, but uh, the younger generation absolutely is taking this up. Hi everyone, this is Sean Burkholder. Sorry, my camera is not working at the moment for some reason, but I have a question um, that focuses again, if we think of models as, uh, we think about the rhetorical or persuasive power of models, how does that relate to the, at least with the general public and the, decision, the folks that are trying to make decisions, how much does the credibility um, of the model makers rely, or, or how much does the rhetorical power rely on the credibility of the model makers? Um, I feel like that's a really interesting question um, when we come to the fact that the minute someone assumes that Forrester's model is garbage, um, it has no power anymore. It's just, you know, it's like my, I don't know, I'm trying to imagine if my grandmother did a sediment transport model, um, if I would believe it, and I don't think I would. Um, so just, a, just a, a thought for you maybe to reflect on or maybe comment on. I, I, can I can quickly comment, which is to say that, yeah, absolutely, no question about that. Um, at the same time, if you have a model that, that um, reproduces a complex phenomena verified by historical data, people are going to pay attention, whatever that model is. And so I think there's, there's, you know, there's a scientific method. So absolutely, cred credibility is is part of it, but the scientific method is still there, and it's either it's either returning results that are meaningful or not. And so we very often have, you know, young PhD candidates who produce an extraordinary model, hard to believe, and then verified. That person credibility is not part of the issue any longer. Sean, um, if the kind of underlying structure of your grandmother's sediment transport model was correct, but her parameter values were wrong and you were playing with it, do you think it would give you a sort of, you know, um, help you develop an intuition for how sediment transport worked, even if you knew it didn't, its parameters weren't mapped onto the very specific condition that you were interested in? I think those, those kind of settings are, are interesting for me because I do think the way a model represents a process, regardless of whether or not it's mapped onto a very specific process, is oftentimes very useful for helping people kind of get their heads around how, how natural processes work. Yeah. I also love I, the idea I, of your grandmother making a sediment trans <laughs> transport yeah. model. <laughs> yeah, we always joke about my dog maybe making sediment transport models sometimes in the backyard. Um, 
the I, I mean, I'm also also interested in just this idea of the the agendas behind the model making. So this is like the idea that the model makers also have, even in John's point of the fact that uh, a model has a client to a degree or a particular question that it's asking. There is um, models aren't universal. They're not unbiased. They actually and looking at the parameters of a model actually unpack the agendas and bias of the model maker also seems like an interesting kind of like problem or it, uh, a project to at least from from my perspective. Uh, but we don't have to belabor this point anyway. I, I want to thank all of you for this discussion today, by the way. It's been amazing. There's another question about the, um, as models and computational capacities grow in power and complexity and sophistication, can any of you speak to how methodologically designers and planners should best cope with an increasingly, increasing overwhelming amount of data about the world that such models produce? That's a big question. Um, is it requiring more specialization, even though we branch out into more interdisciplinarity, I guess, is another way of <laughs> our teams look different these days. Uh, the quick, quick answer. Actually, I think it's leading to less specialization. And I'll give you one example. And that is machine learning as a, as a technique is now spread spreading and spread across pretty much every discipline at MIT. So the you know the idea that that machine learning would fracture and fragment disciplines it's actually doing the opposite it's bringing disciplines together across this this particular tool um, and and the other thing I'll say is that if you have models that are returning a great deal of results data results um, that that is difficult for the user to to understand and use. The model's not working for that user, right? That's that's a flaw in the model and the the interaction with the user. So, you know, mo the best models return what you need to know. Um, so, uh, I, I'm actually I think it, it's the other side, the input side. There's so much data that's out there. The difficulty is knowing which what data, how much data how much time series of that data you need to actually run a meaningful model. I would, I would agree um, in, in, in some ways that the, um, you know, there, there's kind of two different directions this, that, that goes into. There is, there is kind of deeper expertise that goes into the modeling and, and fracturing in, in, in some realms, but there's also new types of, um, you know, user interfaces, new ways, like more, more and more complex models and, and, and deeper data sets are, are distributed to the public and, and put into the hands of non-experts. And that then, like the dissemination of the, those models and the results um, are actually, um, uh, you know, they have, they have other types of relevances, right? Rather than just testing, you know, these, these scenarios. So I think there's, a, there's two interesting ways these things are moving in, 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 in different, different directions. I mean, it's, it's part of the point Lev Manovich makes in the software takes command, right? Is that the, as, as kind of, you know, design software is out there in the world and, and kind of non-experts begin to be able to use these kind of incredibly complex tools, it, it, they become um, kind of new, uh, um, they, they, they order culture and society in different ways. Maybe relatedly, it's, it, there's a question Brett has, um, and that's uh, when we're thinking about those who are kind of generating the landscape, conceptualizing it, making the landscape, and then living in the landscape, there is going to be some, let's say, in, inherent like disruption, for lack of a better term. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing his question, and maybe this goes to more Ilmar's presentation, but you know, how these models might be interpreted and then integrated into, soci into society where we have kind of increasing automation, right? And that kind of increasing automation displaces skilled labor, right? Construction jobs. Um, so what's the, what, where and lie um, the kind of responsibility for de designers participating uh, in that kind of increasing of automation? And you know what are the kind of ethical, social responsibilities embedded in that? I, I paraphrase that question just so we could bridge what John was talking about and Ilmar and the bigger conversation. So sorry, Brett, if I kind of butchered your question. 
Well, I mean, for me, my research is currently not there yet, you know, to kind of start to experiment really on the large scale uh, in, in communities. But I think the, um, I think what we have done so far here is basically you just see a shift in, in, in the responsibilities, right? So the, there's always a, an operator, you know, there's always kind of a, this kind of person who kind of oversees the project and whether he sits in the machine and operates a stick or, you know, sits behind the computer and operates a model in a way i don't i don't necessarily see uh, you know the, the difference especially in in in, in earth moving you know this is very, very particular because in a way with one guy you can already do a lot these days you don't necessarily need a big workforce so i think especially in my case it's just a shift in, in what the person does but not so much in, in the amount of people needed for for the job and of course uh, that i think you know the reality of having machines in the landscape that do things autonomously is of course something very different and, and, and this has to be experimented with and maybe tested and slowly being introduced, right? Because that is something very different from, from what we have today. But uh, yeah, that's maybe um, not necessarily in the next few years. Um, uh, Keith, behind uh, a little bit embedded in your question and also in Il Ilmar's responses is that we haven't raised the issue of equity. There are really, really deep equity issues with the not only the development and the utilization of models, but the but the effects. What what are the, what are they actually recommending? So I can say that our model in in Mokoa is you know working with communities. It's a, it's embedding the priorities of the community, but the community is relatively small. Actually, we can go down there and over a two week period hold a series of meetings, and um, you know lots of people show up. And I think we get a pretty good representation of a of a town that's about 20, 15, 20,000 people. And you know, obviously there are special interests, and we're not naive about that. But 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 in situations, you know, where there are interests that then drive the application of results towards one direction or another, then then you know, this is not a model question. This is a question of equity and the use of automated technology, especially towards a future a present and future increasing uh, uncertainty. And every new technology that's been developed for energy and infrastructure and urban planning and you know, growth in the United States has, has not adequately addressed questions of environmental injustice, right? So I think, I think we have to keep that in mind. So one thing that Ilmar's work really is interesting to me is we've always been wrong about the really complex dynamics between rivers, you know, any hydrological flow and land and geology. John McPhee has that fantastic book about how the, the training of the Mississippi has been a huge failure. I wonder, you know, modeling the complex dynamics and having that be the basis for shaping the land in a way that it is accepting of and much more in concert with changing hydrological conditions and climate change threats and all that would be an interesting thing to Think about it. And that could directly relate to equity because the people who are going to be most affected in those floodplains are usually low income and, and communities of color. I mean, kind of like spinning off of that, it would be it would be really interesting to have a kind of conversation about the the kind of practice method and kind of feedback in this in, indeterminacy that's embedded in Ilmar's approach set within the context where uh, Fatima, right, is working in a low-lying community of color um, where there are a large number of items that are fixed, right, infrastructures in place, but also with the kind of coastal protection systems and the, swi the switch to thinking of it as a system and a watershed and the capacity for different scales of change how, how might how might those two things interact with one another? I think that's a, a really exciting like possibility for really starting to to synthesize and hybridize and and easy and also kind of bring up a lot of points of friction and mismatch. Um, so I, again, I don't think that's a question, uh, but maybe Ilmar and and Fatima um, might might. Uh, coordinate at some point would, would be really exciting. That actually 
really brings us to our end. It's, <laughs> we have one minute left. So unless uh, any speaker has a question for each other or anything else they'd want to say, unfortunately, we have to end the conversation. Um, we could have talked about all of your presentations for an hour each. So really appreciate all of your work and efforts. Thank you to all the speakers and to Brad for emceeing. Um, and again, for those who may not have been here um, yesterday, thank you to Dean Fritz Steiner and our chair, Richard Weller, who spoke first today, and also uh, Billy Fleming, the Wilkes Family Director of the McCarg Center. Really appreciate thank you all. everyone being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic.